uh, I met Glenn through the Atlas Society, which is really called the Objectivist Society. It's a think tank, strange, wonderful group of people dedicated to Ayn Rand. And um, having found her writing truly provocative for this kind of thing, she comes up with a logical problem and she spends four, five, six, a thousand pages and turns it around on its head. And it always fascinates me that among all these worthy gentlemen, there was this woman writing for reason. She wasn't a hot chick. I mean, I don't know about her personal <laughs> life, nor do I care, but she wasn't a model. She wasn't a poetess. For God's sake, she wasn't a movie star. She thought and she wrote. And so when I was a young woman reading her, and I'm sure I didn't understand her very well then, but I liked it, uh, I reread her and reread her over the years. And I fell into, I don't know how, the Atlas Society some years ago and befriended David Kelly, its founder, who's a formidable philosopher and had been a disciple of Ayn Rand, and then met the folks at Atlas. Atlas, get it? Like an Atlas <coughs> shrugged. The translation to Spanish is absolutely hideous. Yes. To call Atlas <laughs> shrugged, La Rebelión de Atlas, is an absolute disaster as far as I'm concerned, words being as important as they are. But we titled this talk just to catch your attention, the morality of capitalism, because even though you are PhDs in economics, like our friend Oscar Echevarria, and PhD in something else, and PhD in something else, and you're so educated, you're also like your Spanish forebears, terrific entrepreneurs, capitalists <coughs> yourself, yourselves. I know that my Cuban friends love money, but they were going to be really caught in the web of this title of the morality of capitalism. And we did gotcha. <laughs> so uh, that's why you're here and these very smart guys uh, Joe Assel is really kind of disgusting because every time you sit with him, he knows so much and he's very depressing. So anyway, but as you could see, so is Jaroslav and so is Glenn. And you haven't heard Andy Eichen and Robin Kerner. Bright. It's a pleasure to hang out with these people. And so we invited recently arrived Cuban dissidents. I was very touched by two expressions of what they were like, with three. One of them, Francisco Chaviano said, I was in jail 17 years, and the only book I had was The Road to Serfdom. I read it during the day, and it was my pillow at night. How about that? A young man from Ciego de Avila, Isaín Valdivia, stood up and said, for 20 years I have been trying to put together what the hell these thoughts mean. I would read this, I would read that, I would try to match it. And at the Liberty Camp, I have made a 180 degree turn into creating, I'm almost quoting him verbatim, a conceptual framework to hang these ideas from. If nobody else had come, all the six months of work and the money we didn't have and the money we had and all the effort to put the Liberty Camp together, I would have been pleased with those two. But then, Normando Hernandez of the group of 75 got up and told Robin Kerner, who was talking on a charged linguistic stuff, you should get all his blogs and follow him, he's fireworks. 
and he said, I was never freer than while I was in prison. And I mean, this, these four days were heavy. I was exhausted. I absolutely, weren't you tired? <laughs> I mean, mi madre. So, <laughs> however, uh, we uh, finished the camp with a deficit. I think we owe about $600. And yet, we are meeting soon and we have very active emailing and messaging communication to see how we can do far more liberty camps. We think it's an incredible instrument to have a discussion on the morality of capitalism for kids who've been born into the pioneros and for people who come here and we, we the oldies, the historic exiles, tend to dismiss because they're dressed differently because they're silent, cautious, and I mean, they're, they have bright, bold minds. They say Guano. So, uh, I don't know, they're bright. And don't confuse going to an Ivy or even University of Miami or elsewhere with being smart. They may not have had our advantages of a linear formal education, but I was very impressed with them. And I, I knew them. I had spent two or three months persuading them that they needed to find a babysitter to leave their kids somehow and come and spend three and a half days with us. It was exhausting persuading them, I mean. I drank more coffee than I usually do normal circumstances. <laughs> but they came. And again, with Cuban indiscipline, 33 committed to attending, 25 came the first night, and 19 all the other days that followed. So what can I say? I just hope the ones who didn't come feel like utter, no, I'm not, like utter, <laughs> Yes, um, garbage, compost. Uh, compost. compost, thank you. <laughs> when they hear from their buddies what they missed. And uh, so now, just very briefly, Andy, no, no, te pare que yo no voy a decir más nada. Okay. I, I don't know about you, Raul, I never argue with her. <laughs> okay. Uh, very happy marriage of 48 years because he has learned that. that. <laughs> so. Yes, dear, no, dear. <laughs> Who? Raul? No, no, just, just okay, so um, let me tell you just very briefly about all the misconceptions about Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand was not and is not someone that is dangerous to read. What is dangerous is not to read her. Ludwig von Mises, once I finish reading the four books, I will ask Jaroslav for a job. The books are hard. Those are hard. I mean, the guy was thick and dense. And then he quotes something in Greek. Honest to God, if you don't have a Ludwig von Mises book in your shelf, try it. It has things in Greek and in Arabic. And in anyway, that's hard. Ayn Rand's a piece of cake. The novels are fun. Um, we the Living is very depressing. Very depressing because as a young woman, she's writing about the horrors of Bolshevik Russia when she left as an exile to go to New York. But Anthem is, is not so hot in my personal estimation, but Atlas Shrugged and the Fountainhead are truly masterpieces of mixing fiction and real people with overgrown governments. Overgrown governments, perhaps it was Kafka who said it first, create bureaucracies that are very frightening or check out your Milan Kundera and you will see it very clearly. The policeman at the door in Kundera is very much this overgrown government for whom there is no right answer. <clears throat> Once he gets to the door, you either go to the concentration camp or 
you're screwed if you refuse. So there's no winning. And it's not so much socialism and capitalism for me. It is that ultimate freedom yes. to do whatever the hell you want to do and live with the consequences that all these writers, and curiously they're all Central European or Russian, or um, uh, which is very interesting, but go back to your college books, read Kafka, read Kundera, and then tackle Atlas Shrugged. It's an incredibly fun book. Don't try to read it in Kindle. It's very <laughs> depressing to read it in Kindle because it never finishes. Well, it never <laughs> finishes in real life, but, but it's handable. Now, her nonfiction books like Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, or The Virtue of Selfishness are <coughs> must reads. They're little, stick them in your purse, ladies. They're perfect for waiting in the dentist or the doctors or whatever. <laughs> And you can underline it, which drives my husband crazy, but underline it to your heart's content. When I reread uh, <clears throat> Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal for the Liberty Camp, I found that the first five pages were all yellow. That's not very good highlighting. I was highlighting everything. <laughs> <Yes>. So <laughs> take your fears away. Don't fear Ayn Rand. It's an exciting, exuberant, mind-challenging hours. That's it. Thank you. Okay.